Hello everyone, uh, welcome to Live at Kigali, the beautiful, clean and green city which is uh, hosting the Kigali Global Dialogue. My name is Zillu Rahman. Uh, by profession I'm a journalist and uh, a TV anchor. I'm also working with a think tank named Center for Governance Studies as executive director in Bangladesh. As a TV uh, person, uh, I have to be strict with the time. Uh, as the world faces the pressing challenge of climate change, uh, it has become increasingly clear that uh, the rapid replacement of fossil fuel uh, with clean energy technologies is essential. Despite significant ad advancement in climate-friendly tech, uh, there are persistent barriers that hinder the realization of their full potential. Today, uh, we have brought together two distinguished experts who will share their insights on these barriers and discuss strategies uh, to overcome them. With that note, let me uh, introduce panelists around me. Uh, to my left, Dr. Shelly Kadia, Senior Fellow and Associate Director uh, at the Energy and Resources Institute, Terry, India. Uh, next to her, Ms. Valentina Belesi, a policy analyst at the OECD. Uh, let me start with uh, Valentina. As you co-authored OECD uh, guidance on transition uh, finance, what's your take about uh, uh, the need for uh, credible climate transition plans? Yes, so at the OECD we started working on transition finance already a couple of years ago and the, the main rationale behind this is that we realized that green finance has been growing quite a lot in recent years, um, but it's still limited in the sense that it's quite uh, binary, um, or at least the green finance approaches and taxonomies that have been developed so far are quite binary because they define what is green today, and so all that investment is really focusing on, uh, and rightly so, on, on the green activities that um, are already uh, low emissions or so renewable energy and ener energy efficiency and all of that. Um, but um, we have also realized that there are a number of activities that are um, hard to abate uh, to date and uh, really uh, emission intensive, especially in industry, which is a big emitter globally. And they obviously also need the, the means, the resources, the financing to um, get to a low emission state at some point in the future. So that's where the conversation on transition finance has started. Uh, a number of governments have begun to uh, develop um, approaches, taxonomies on transition finance, and also a lot of market actors uh, have been doing um, uh, transition finance guidance, principles, and a variety of other instruments. Um, the, um, the key point is that there's no common definition across um, across actors, obviously, because the question of transition per se, it's naturally one that really depends on each jurisdiction, on the socioeconomic development pathway that a country has, on the resources, uh, on the political and social uh, dimensions. Uh, but uh, the, all, the, all the common um, the common element that the, all those approaches have is that is this focus on uh, activities that don't have a green substitute to date, but that are on a, on a pathway to to become uh, low emission in the future. Um, so in, at the OECD, we published the OECD guidance on transition finance last year, um, and we really focused on ensuring that. Um, companies, uh, more companies have credible uh, corporate transition plans. Uh, because even if you might not um, internationally agree on um, what is transition today, um, perhaps we will at some point in the future, at least to ensure that there is you know, environmental integrity and environmental credibility on those activities where we don't really know uh, their environmental impact as of now, we at least need to know um, what is a company's plan um, to, um, to achieve um, targets, for instance, now that um, many, many companies worldwide are, are setting net, net zero targets either to, 
2040, 2050, 2060, etc. So in the guidance, there's 10 different elements on what constitutes a credible corporate transition plan um, on a variety of different dimensions. I, th I think um, um, one of the key uh, elements that emerges is, and that we will do also further work on this in the future, is, is um, making sure that the, the plan has some mechanisms in place to avoid the emission locking in the future. So whenever um, making an, inv an investment or um, to, um, for, for an activity that is not aligned to date, at least you have some safeguards or mechanisms to avoid emission locking in the future. I'll stop here for now. Uh, th thank you, Valentina. I'll come to you again. Uh, Dr. Shelley, uh, as the Associate Director at the uh, Energy and Resources Institute, uh, you possess uh, valuable insights into the technological advancements uh, in clean energy. Could you uh, discuss the innovative technological uh, solutions that can help overcome, to, uh, overcome the barriers faced in uh, the de deployment of clean energy uh, technologies in developing countries like India? Thank you so much uh, for, Ma your, please. for your question. And uh, so uh, firstly, I'd like to uh, start with the note of optimism that, that <clears throat> there are lots of technological advancements that are taking place in the clean energy space. And, uh, <clears throat> and they're also uh, you know, giving competition to the not so clean uh, technologies. And so it looks that you know, we are heading towards a optimistic uh, scenario. However, uh, having said that, uh, and having look, uh, you know, if we look at the enormous challenge of climate change and the level of emissions that need to uh, go down and go down fast, uh, I would say that st we still have to work on technological advancement and to develop those breakthrough technologies. Uh, going by the current uh, technological scenario in the clean energy space, uh, we broadly talk about uh, renewables, solar, wind, um, and, and even, even, even if we look at these technologies, these clean energy uh, technologies, on the uh, supply side, uh, there are lots of technological issues uh, and barriers uh, that would need to be addressed. For instance, look at renewable or solar uh, specifically. Uh, if you look at the share that solar energy uh, can contribute to in the overall energy mix, it can range from anywhere to 50% in high sunshine uh, countries uh, and you know whenever there's peak sunshine to as low as 10%. And so what do you do to kind of manage this fluctuation or you know you need power flexibility, you need good energy storage system, uh, which at the moment are not as affordable. So there still needs to be a lot more innovation in that space technological innovation, but also in terms of the delivery uh, innovation um, to make it more affordable. For instance, you, you know, we can't look at um, energy system which is totally renewable energy based without having uh, the system of, let's say, bat uh, you know, energy storage that can then continuously provide that renewable energy produced during, the, say, for, from solar during the daytime uh, it can provide that during the night time as well. So that is one very crucial aspect. aspect. The other aspect is when we are even talking about solutions like, because when we look at clean energy transitions, we look at it from an energy systems perspective, which constitutes both supply and demand. And even when we are talking about technologies like electric vehicles or, or, or energy storage, these are very heavily dependent on critical minerals. So again, there needs to be a lot of R&D to kind of see what other materials can substitute these critical minerals and what kind of green chemistry. So for example, lithium is not as well found, but, but maybe sodium is. So, so green chemistry is one area you know, which uh, one needs to see uh, a lot more uh, innovation in. Uh, coming to the delivery and social innovation side of uh, green technologies, often, we see the larger narrative is going towards supply side uh, when you're talking about energy transitions, just energy transitions. So, okay, once you move away from coal, you're done. But look at the demand side, look at the micro, small, medium enterprises, for example, in India. 
or look at the farmers. Uh, or even look at the common person who has to use uh, transportation means. So there, there is a lot more scope uh, on innovations at that side as well. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you. Shailen. Valentina, you have a deep understanding uh, of the financial aspects of uh, clean energy transitions. Uh, could you shed uh, light on the specific challenges faced in uh, mobilizing funds for clean energy projects in OECD countries? Very briefly, please. Yes, so I mean, one of the key challenges that we see is that obviously um, most of the investments in, in renewables to date are really focused on OECD countries and not enough um, in, um, in developing countries. And um, so this is um, a, key, a key challenge uh, that needs to be addressed, some of the common um, bar barriers um, often relate to, you know, the enabling environment. So, um, as also you were mentioning before, the um, not only the technical um, and capacity barriers, but also really like the the legal the legal frameworks, the investment frameworks at the country level, um, and often really the the country risk represents still um, a, a too high risk for um, an investor to to come in even in, in technologies that are quite mature to date and whose cost is also falling quite fast. Um, so I think those are uh, some of the barriers. Um, since it is quite a mature uh, sector, um, whenever, we, uh, see, whenever we talk about the development finance aspect to that, um, one um, approach that has really emerged as a potential solution is the use of blended finance. So um, using these scarce development public resources more efficiently to mobilize the private sector at scale. Uh, Shelley, uh, how can the G20 work towards uh, removing uh, financing and the regulatory barriers uh, that impede the scaling up of, of these uh, technologies? And what measures can be taken to enhance uh, access uh, to these technologies for countries in the global south? Uh, just in uh, one and a half minutes. Um, thank you so much for that question. Of course, India is holding the G20 presidency, and under the Sherpa track, uh, there is the, environment, uh, the Energy Transitions Working Group. And uh, you know, so so definitely, G20 has an important role to play. It is, it is a consumer of two-thirds of the world energy. But more importantly, uh, G20 itself you know, controls the frontiers of technology. 95% of R&D investment uh, in uh, technology is actually in G20 countries. So uh, it, would be, it would be nice to see a technology bank you know, and even a financing mechanism that can offer some of those financial innovations like, you know, uh, blended finance, uh, but also a, a, a platform which uh, engages in sharing of best practices across countries, not just in the supply side, but also in the demand side. The other thing I feel that G20 should also challenge this dominant paradigm of just energy transitions, which is just focused on supply, to also look at energy demand side technologies uh, as well and include that in this bank. Thank you. Uh, as we uh, conclude uh, our insightful discussion on tech, energy, and uh, just green transitions, uh, we have gained a valuable uh, perspective from our uh, esteemed speakers. Uh, they have been highlighted the persisting uh, barriers in policy, uh, regulations, and uh, finance that hinder the full potential of uh, clean energy technologies. Uh, let us all uh, be catalyst for change and actively contribute uh, to the transition towards a sustainable and uh, green future. Uh, Dr. Shelly Kedia, Ms. Valentina Veloci, uh, Belesi, uh, thank you for uh, joining us. Uh, and uh, together, let us build a world powered by clean energy. To end this, uh, I wish uh, I would like to say goodbye and thank you. <laughs>